Well, good evening, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started with our class. Uh, we'll have a word of prayer and then begin. Now, Heavenly Father, we come entering your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts, with, with joy in our minds, and knowing that you not only have our backs, but you lift us up and you, you hold us high so that we can have that hope in, in eternity. And Heavenly Father, we know that uh, much of this life uh, tries to drag us down, tries to, to move us from the ideals that we stand firmly upon in your name. And we ask that you, you strengthen us and give us courage that we might ever persist in, in doing those things that are pleasing in your sight. And Heavenly Father, we, we, we thank you for this body of believers that gathers here. We thank you for the willingness to come with uh, open Bibles, with open hearts, uh, and with uh, hands and feet that are ready to go out into a world that uh, oftentimes is not so open, and, and yet uh, you, you send us into the field and, and uh, uh, to preach uh, your, your word and to make known the gospel. Heavenly Father, uh, bless the efforts uh, as we go out and we plant and we water, and uh, may the, the increase uh, ever be yours and glorify your name. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can have together this evening to open up the scripture and to learn the wonderful lessons that you would have us uh, learn uh, so <clears throat> that we might move forward and grow in our maturity. Heavenly Father, be with us this evening. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. Okay. Uh, if you want to turn your Bibles to the book of um, Jude. We are in Jude. We are in Jude. Yeah. We did 3rd John last week. See, Shirley's got me all rattled now. All right, book of Jude. Uh, Jude is an amazing book. Uh, Jude is one of those uh, phenomenal books. Uh, it is a general epistle. Uh, it's not written to anybody in particular, uh, so to speak, uh, but it is written kind of for all Christians uh, who, um, you know, <clears throat> bear, uh, bear that name. Uh, and it is designed for a couple of different purposes, and we'll get into some of those uh, in just uh, a minute. But there are a lot of interesting things uh, about the, the book of Jude, uh, which we'll jump right into. Uh, however, I did want to kind of start throwing uh, a couple of things out uh, to you. Um, next week uh, is, of course, camp week. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure yet what is going to uh, happen on Wednesday uh, with that, uh, but uh, many of us will be uh, at camp um, but uh, uh, so we, I'm not going to include that week in our study. The week we come back, uh, we'll be doing uh, a little bit in Revelation, uh, and uh, that will probably take us a couple of weeks. It's one of the few books that we'll spend uh, a couple of weeks in uh, because we want to start with kind of introducing, um, again, uh, the idea of apocalyptic language, uh, what that means, how to interpret it, uh, so on and so forth, uh, and then we're going to jump into Revelation. Uh, so we'll have at least a, a couple weeks, maybe maybe even three, because uh, I know a lot of folks uh, are interested uh, in the book of Revelation. Uh, you know, for every ten questions I get, I, I would say probably you know a good forty uh, percent of them are, are probably uh, about Revelation. So it, it is a somewhat perplexing book, uh, but it's a it's a wonderful book, uh, and sometimes we shy away from it because it's complex. Uh, and that's, that's really a shame because it, it is a very encouraging book. Uh, it is a book that talks about, uh, you know, how we overcome uh, our, our eternity with God uh, and uh, that future kind of state that we, <clears throat> you know, will be in. So um, we're going to spend a good deal of time with it. Uh, but just to kind of let you know what the timeline is. Uh, so we're looking at, at just a, a few weeks. Uh, so after that, uh, we've finished the Bible Snapshot series. Uh, so be thinking about what you want to do next. Uh, it's always good uh, to get uh, your input simply because, you know, otherwise you get to do what Ed wants to do. Uh, and what Ed wants to do isn't always exactly uh, what you want to do. Uh, so think about it and put some thought in. Uh, and, um, you know, next week, um, not next week, uh, you know, in the following weeks, uh, just let me know. Uh, let me know if you've come up with, you know, it doesn't have to be some grand idea. It could be just, you know, I've always wanted to know about, you know, fill in the blank. Or, or I wish I knew more about fill in the blank. Um, you know, or what does the Bible say about, you know, we could do something like, you know, that. Um, or kind of what does the Bible say about sort of series or whatever you want to do. 
All right, but it'll take a little time to get it ready. So the sooner you can give me uh, your ideas, uh, the better we can kind of approach the topic. Uh, so be thinking about that uh, and let me know. I mean, if you've already got a couple, feel free to give them to me tonight. Because uh, again, the more time I have, the better uh, our study will be, uh, I believe. Uh, it'll give you more time, it'll give me more time. Uh, and um, that's uh, mutually beneficial. All right, so let's jump into the book of Jude. Uh, and like we did with uh, uh, First uh, and Second and, and Third John, uh, what I really want us to do <clears throat> is I want us to just kind of read the whole book. Uh, Jude is a book that's one chapter, much like First John, Second John, Third John, uh, or excuse me, Second John, Third John, uh, and um, it's only 25 verses, uh, 613 words uh, in the English uh, version, uh, and um, or most English versions, right around 613 uh, words. Uh, so that's not a whole lot. So let's just begin uh, by going to the book itself. Uh, and uh, reading so that we can kind of have the book as the background when we begin to talk about it. Jude, a servant of Christ uh, and the brother of, uh, and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I find it necessary or found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God in, into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved people out of the land <clears throat> of Egypt, afterward destroyed those uh, who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay with their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, served as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to announce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all, <clears throat> uh, these people, uh, blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them! For they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feast, and they feast with you without fear, shep <clears throat> shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the glo gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment to all, uh, or on all, and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodly, <clears throat> ungodliness that they may have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires, they are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their ungodly passions. It is, those, <clears throat> it is these who cause division, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the one God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. All right. Interesting book. 
uh, kind of get a little miniature history lesson uh, in here. Uh, reminds us uh, of a few things, and of course, he has a point for all of that. But let's just kind of open up with uh, the the question: What do you think is the point after having read the the book? And I know we just read it, and uh, for the most part, you know, it's good to go back and read it uh, a couple of times. Uh, but um, what do you think is the main point uh, of the book? I mean, it's twenty five verses. Uh, there are what one, two, three. There's like eight paragraphs, maybe. Um, you know, so a small letter uh, made up of eight paragraphs. Uh, so what do you think the main point is? What is Jude trying to get across? Yeah, I think that's the, the predominant thing. Uh, he's warning about false teachers. And he gives a whole bunch of different characteristics uh, about what the false teacher will look like. Um, what constitutes uh, a, a false teacher uh, what does not, I, I think he alludes to, uh, constitute a, a false teacher, um, but <clears throat> mentions a whole bunch about that. All right, anything else stand out about it? He kind of gives us uh, sort of his intention. Uh, if you go back to the very beginning uh, in verse 3, uh, and I think he kind of starts off one way. He says, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation... Uh, which he does continue to write about. Uh, He just approaches it kind of from a different angle. Uh, Now he has to sort of intertwine it with this whole notion of contending for the faith. Uh, I wanted to write to you just about, you know, our common salvation, uh, but I found it necessary uh, to appeal to you to contend for the faith uh, that was once delivered. Uh, So I think this twofold kind of purpose uh, is given right there uh, in verse 3. Okay? Uh, any other thoughts? Just purpose. Okay, well, let's jump into kind of the historical background. Who is Jude? Who's Jude? Well, he identifies himself in the book. I mean, if we look at the text, uh, it says, Jude, a servant of Christ, the brother of James. All right, so we've got two designations for him. It's pretty hard to mistake servant of Christ. Um, that's Fairly clear, right? Uh, brother of James. Who's James? Who's James? Okay, well, there are a couple of James to consider, right? You know, there is, for instance, um, the James who was the apostle, right? Yeah, the James who was an apostle. Um, do, do we know? Do we know anything about uh, the James who was an apostle? Well, sure we do, right? He had a brother. And his brother's name was John, right? And John's mentioned a lot. Um, and um, But, you know, up to this point, uh, Jude, if, if Jude is the brother of that James, uh, that's not something that John really mentions. Um, it's not something that is mentioned in any other place in, in the Scripture. Um, so, right. Yeah, and it's not mentioned that John has another brother. Uh, and his name is Jude or, or, you know, Judas or however the, uh, you know, different, different people have different names. All right. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who testify, you know, or, or make statements, let's put it that way, uh, about who these guys are, James and John. I mean, they're not minor characters. Uh, you know, we're introduced to the mom, we're introduced to the brothers, uh, and we're told a, a decent amount about them. Uh, and Jude's never really mentioned uh, if that brother is, you know, one of those. And, um, you know, why does he pick just James? Why would he not say the brother of James and John? You know, so a lot of people, they don't give much stock uh, to that. Uh, they don't put much weight in that. Uh, at the end of the day, it just says brother of James. Uh, what other James could it be? Hmm? The writer of the book of James. All right, so who wrote the book of James? Okay, the, the half-brother of Christ, who, who was a non-believer, um, you know, prior to the time uh, of his resurrection. Uh, you, you know, I mean, it was uh, fairly well known that, that his own brothers really just just prior uh, to his trial uh, and to that uh, feast uh, before the trial, 
I would actually speak to him in mocking tones. Uh, you know, hey, I mean, I mean, if if you are the Savior, you know, I mean, why not go up and show yourself to everybody? And you know, they seemingly mocked him. Uh, and and really, as far as we know, they weren't really supportive in his ministry. We do know that there was uh, a time when you know the mother and uh, unidentified family members um, come to a house where he is literally being bombarded with uh, people who want to hear his teaching uh, and they want to speak with him. Um, but there are a few times that we're introduced to uh, the family uh, of Jesus. Um, but uh, we do know, uh, we do know that he does have uh, a half brother and his name is James. Uh, and uh, we do know that, uh, that this James does become uh, a uh, leader in uh, the church. Uh, he is mentioned, uh, for instance, in Acts chapter 15. Uh, Acts chapter 15, um, and uh, you know, was part of that whole council. Um, I believe it's 15. Uh, that whole council where they were trying to figure out, okay, what do we do with the the, the Gentiles? Um, you know, how do we encourage them? Uh, you know, are we supposed to you know kind of funnel them through Judaism, um, so on and so forth? Uh, and John or James becomes a you know, a leader in the church, uh, and um, uh, we're not told about his conversion, really. Um, you know, we're not told really uh, too much uh, about uh, about him. Uh, many scholars think that uh, you know the, this Jude uh, is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Jude is uh, the brother of uh, James uh, and uh, the servant uh, of Christ, who, who was his uh, half uh, brother. Now there are other options too. Um, some people believe that uh, he is uh, the apostle named uh, Thaddeus. Uh, Thaddeus, uh, and there are a couple other names uh, for Thaddeus. Uh, for instance, um, he is also called Judas. Uh, Judas. Um, that's why Judas is identified sometimes as you know the betrayer. It's why he's sometimes referred to as Iscariot uh, to kind of mark the distinction between the two. But that's pretty common. Uh, we realize that most uh, of the apostles and uh, and you know some of the disciples that we're introduced to, they have multiple names. Uh, I mean, look at Peter. Peter is called Peter. He's also called Cephas. He's also called Simon. Uh, you know, so th- there are a multitude of names for some of these individuals. Uh, and some believe that this was uh, Jude uh, is just kind of a shortened form of Judas. Uh, and which is really just another name for the apostle Thaddeus, uh, you know. And, and there is some evidence, you know, for uh, for that. Uh, but the the strongest seeming argument uh, is that Jude is the brother of James, who was the half brother of um, Christ. You know, so you can I mean you can take a look at authorship, uh, but you know, when push comes to shove, uh, authorship is not necessarily the biggest thing about a book. I know we mention it every time, um, but it, you know it, it's not the most important thing. Um, what is the most important thing about books of the Bible is that they bear, you know, the marks of inspiration. Uh, they they bear that uh, claim and divine uh, authority as not only being from God, uh, but uh, proven uh, to have been uh, from God. Uh, and of course, you know, at first, um, like many of the books, uh, this was something that was sort of remained aloof among men, uh, and they weren't quick to accept it. But by 200, uh, by the year 200 AD, uh, it was part of uh, all of the, uh, what you sometimes call canon, uh, which just means model uh, of Scripture. Uh, it was widely accepted or fully uh, accepted as being part of uh, the original New Testament uh, Scripture. Okay, uh, Jude sets off writing about the salvation of God that is common for all men, uh, but is then later compelled. And we don't know exactly what it is uh, that compels him. Um, he doesn't really spell it out. You know, sometimes when Paul wrote, he would, uh, you know, he would say, you know, well, those of the household of Chloe came and, you know, told me. Or, you know, it has been reported that. Um, well, Jude doesn't really do that. Uh, we don't know exactly how he gets the information that, that he has. Um, uh, about you know the the church or the people to whom he is is writing, uh, but we do know that uh, he is given the information. Um, he starts off to write about uh, you know the common salvation uh, that uh, they have, 
uh, and um, ends up having to include this idea of uh, contending, you know, for uh, the faith. Uh, to kind of make it sort of a simple summary, uh, there were those who were coming in and they were doing uh, essentially two things. Um, <clears throat> number one, they were taking advantage uh, of the liberty uh, or the graciousness uh, of God uh, to promote things that were sinful. Uh, and number two, uh, they were basically denying the authority of Christ. Um, you know, down to the point of saying that uh, he he was not uh, he was not the the Messiah, uh, but instead, um, you know, perhaps uh, something else. Uh, so they were denying uh, him. Uh, then James, not James, Jude goes on uh, to point out all of these examples. Uh, you know, he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. He talks about Cain. He talks about angels. He talks about uh, Israel. He talks about Korah and Balaam and, and all of those things. And the reason he does that is to give these ancient examples uh, of how sin leads people to apostasy uh, and um, how these folks, uh, if they were not careful, uh, were going to be led away from that common salvation into this apostasy that is also uh, common uh, among men who choose not uh, to place themselves uh, under the authority of Christ uh, and, and to do those things that um, are, are part of that God, part of <clears throat> excuse me God's uh, graciousness uh, and I think that verses 12 and 16 kind of sum up uh, that section uh, and again we read it already but take a look real quick uh, these are hidden reefs of your love feast as they feast with you uh, without fear shepherds feeding themselves waterless clouds swept along by wind, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain uh, advantage. All right, so that's kind of his estimation in this section about these you know, false uh, teachers and those who are going to use the grace of God uh, to promote ideas that, that are sinful, uh, which are really nothing more than designs to pull people away uh, from God and Christ uh, in, into this um, apostate kind of condition. All right, so let's uh, let's take a look at, at the key verse. Uh, again, you may differ. You know, you may go back. Uh, and I was real tempted to make verse three the key verse. Uh, I think uh, of all the verses of Jude, um, verse three is probably the most recognizable verse. Uh, most folks uh, know uh, contend earnestly for the faith, um, in the very least. Um, so, you know, that's a good one to pick. It's a good one to pick. Uh, but quite frankly, I, I like verse 24 uh, as far as um, kind of a summary of the book because it includes the idea of stumbling and yet at the same time talks about Christ uh, and how, um, you, you know, we can through him have that glory and joy. So it says, Now uh, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence uh, of his glory with great joy. Uh, and I like the verse because I think in the end, you know, verse 3 tells us why he had the right. Uh, verse 24 tells us what he's hoping for, uh, that they will not follow this falsehood, but that they will uh, find themselves, um, you know, uh, along the side of Christ who will keep them uh, and uh, help them, you know, sustain their, their faith. All right, um, key phrase, uh, keep or kept, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, key, word or key words, keep, kept, uh, and then the key phrase, uh, earnestly contend, uh, are the ones that I kind of chose as the key. Uh, Shirley, did you have a comment, question? No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, and that's kind of what he's doing, isn't it? I mean, you know, he, he's concluding his letter, um, and this is the part where he's giving them kind of the, the, the final encouragement, you, you know. Um, and, and, of course, a lot of the letters that are written are this way. You know, we start off with, you know, grace and peace and joy or, you know, something along that line to you and the saints that meet in your house or, or you know, they differ. Uh, and then most of them conclude with some kind of... Um, you know, some kind of, you know, encouragement uh, as well. And I think that's what he does here in the last two verses. 
starts off that way, but then he winds up that same way, uh, trying to be encouraging, uh, trying to, to lift them up and, and trying to, you know, uh, help them, help them. So yeah, I, I think it, it, it would really make a good um, kind of phrase of encouragement for us too. Okay, very good. Anyone else? John? Verse 9? Okay, let, let's read it and then um, see what you have. Uh, but when the archangel contending with the devil was disputing about the body of Moses, uh, he did not presume to pronounce a, a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Okay, so what's your question? What it means? Okay. Um, well, let me give you the, uh, let, let me give you the, um, sort of shortened version, uh, of it. Um, essentially what he's saying is that, is that not even, not even, um, the devil, uh, and certainly not Michael, uh, Denied the authority of God. Uh, the, you know, the, this, you know, not, they, they were unwilling. The, these, these heavenly beings, uh, these spiritual, um, uh, these spiritual entities, I, you know, however you want to, you know, kind of whatever category you want to put them in, um, you know, they would not even lower themselves. To, to blaspheme God uh, and, um, you, you know, deny his authority. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the point. Uh, you, you know, that's what these people were doing. That's what these false teachers are doing. They're, they're blaspheming against God by, you know, using his word and using his grace uh, in ways that are designed to lead people away from the truth and to cause them to become uh, apostates uh, and uh, to use the graciousness of God to promote you know things that that are sinful um, you know so by that they renounce the authority of God uh, and they blaspheme against him and, and not even Michael uh, or the devil himself would do that it's kind of the point now as far as them contending over Moses body uh, I don't know that that's ever recorded in scripture you know, we, we do know, I mean, what, what happens to Moses? Yeah, he's, he's, he's taken up onto the mountains. He's able to look into, uh, in, into the, um, promised land. And, and we're told that, you know, he, he was not really diminished in, in his physical, um, you know, attributes, but, you know, there he, he perished. Uh, but that's really all we know. Uh, so you come to Jude and, and you sort of get this, uh, you know, this different picture. Uh, and um, on the surface of it, I think it does present for us, you know, somewhat of a challenge, if you want to put it that way, uh, because this is the only place we're really told about this event. Um, it's not contradictory. It's not... Uh, it's just kind of additional information for what happened to Moses. Um, but I, I think I know what you mean. Um, yeah, I mean, that would be one way to do it. Uh, of course, for them, uh, you, you know, Scripture is going to have a somewhat different meaning um, because, you know, they're not, again, they're not in possession of, of the, uh, you know, they can't just run to their shelf and get a copy of the Bible and pull it out. Uh, so, you know, it has a, a, a little different, uh, a little different meaning, but 
to take something that is in there, in any of it, uh, that they had seen or read or heard, uh, and, and pervert it. Um, whether it be ripping it out of context or whether it is kind of adding to it, uh, taking away from it. Um, and there are a number of different ways you can do that, but that's probably the biggest way people do, um, you know, blaspheme uh, against God and, and take advantage of His graciousness, you know. But again, I mean, it's a perplexing passage because this is, this is the first time we've heard this. Uh, and this is hundreds of years after the event actually occurred. Uh, and we're, but you know, it's kind of like, um, uh, how do you want to put it? This is kind of the upper stage story uh, as opposed to the lower. You know, like in Job, for instance, we, we know what's going on up here in, in the heavenly realm. And then it happens down here in Job's realm. Uh, and we kind of get this twofold picture. Well, that's not normal. We don't have that for every book. Um, but you know, here we're getting kind of a little bit of a glimpse behind the scenes, I think. Um, and, but again, the, the whole point is not even these, you know, spiritual uh, powers uh, dared to blaspheme or, or override the authority of God is kind of the main point. The rest of it is just additional information about Moses. Yeah. No. Carrie. Right. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, essentially the same thing, you know, I mean, Michael, you know, did not, you know, uh, presumed to make the judgment that it was reserved only for God, did not uh, revile, did not, uh, you know, in that blaspheme. Right. Right. Yeah. Right, and, and that's the point. I mean, you know, the whole point of this section is, he, I mean, he's not just talking about Cain or Korah or, or any of these people just to bring them up again. Um, it, it's all within the context of, you know, sin uh, and where sin leads us. Uh, comparing that to what these uh, apostate teachers are trying to do. Uh, you know, I mean, Korah led a rebellion that caused the ground to open up and people got swallowed. Um, you know, not a good thing. Um, and that's where, you know, denying Christ uh, and um, denying Christ and blaspheming God is going to lead you, you know, covered over uh, and in a, in a pit with darkness. Uh, it's just not, you know, you know, I mean, it's, there are a lot of parallels. Philip? No? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I thought I saw it out of my Surely. Well, well, God told him to get, to go out and speak to you know to to the rock, and and he struck it. And not only that, he um, right. Right. Yeah, he basically took credit for something God was doing. Yeah, yeah. So, 
All right, anyone else? All right, let's, let's move on. We, you can read the outline. Um, there are several interesting facets about uh, the book of Jude, uh, things that you can track through by, by and large. Um, the, to me, the, the, the best section uh, is that whole section about uh, the, the false teachers. Uh, and um, it's, it's kind of mentioned here a little bit, um, but, you, you know, it's, uh, it's just a really, really powerful statement. Uh, about who these people are and, and what they're trying to do. Um, but he spends a great deal of time discussing some fundamentals of faith, um, how we're to be you know, Christians who kind of have that upward look uh, toward eternity. Um, and um, then there in that third section, the apostate are, uh, and of course it's mainly verse 12, but you, know, you, can, look at, um, you, you can look at it, uh, and, and it's just very, very descriptive. Uh, and uh, just kind of interesting. Uh, for instance, he, he says, these are hidden reefs at your love feasts. And he's speaking of the false teacher. What do you think that even means? Hidden reefs at your love feast. Well, think of love feast as um, like a fellowship dinner. Like a fellowship dinner. It's probably most, mostly what we would think of it as. How would anybody be a hidden reef? Well, what does a hidden reef do? It wrecks you, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you think you're safe, you think the water's calm, you're riding along, and then, boom. You know, it, it's funny. I mean, right over by us, uh, just around the corner from Madeira Beach, you, you can see one of these hidden rock walls. Uh, you know, when the, when the tide is up, you can't see it at all. Um, it looks like there's just a boat out there kind of leaning sideways. But when the water goes down, you, you notice that that boat is sitting on this, this little pile of rocks. Uh, and um, I carry actually met a guy who saw that accident happen. Um, but, um, you know, that's what happens. You're shipwrecked. Uh, so, you know, what are these false teachers doing? Well, they're shipwrecking people who are coming together to, to have fellowship and, and share. Um, it's a very, very interesting language that Jude uses. Uh, and as far as I know, uh, th these are terms that are really not employed elsewhere in the Scripture, um, you know, which is further fascinating. Um, but, you know, waterless clouds, um, you know, to, for people who lived in a dry and thirsty land, uh, who, who were constantly looking for clouds, and not just because they were thirsty, but because they needed that rain to fall, so that the crop could grow, so that they could make the money, so they could feed the kids and the family would live. Uh, it was vitally important for them. Here come the clouds. They never drop rain. Never drop rain. It's like the dust bowl uh, in, in our country. You know. Um, so he uses some very interesting language, but the bell's rung, and I know we're going past, but uh, I encourage you to read Jude. Uh, and uh, continue looking at it. Uh, he, Jude is just a very, very, fast, very, very fascinating book. Appreciate everybody for the comments. And we go kayaking, and, and uh, you know it's, it's something that we we like to do. And I think uh, Tammy and Keith first introduced uh, that to us when uh, they had their uh, kayaks. But uh, we, we've since bought a couple of our own. And and Carrie one day says, "Let's go kayaking." Uh, and of course, you know, having not kayaked anywhere around here, uh, we just figure if you find some water and it looks okay, put the kayak in and what could possibly go wrong, right? A lot of things. Uh, fortunately, most of those things that could go wrong did not go wrong, uh, except for the expenditure of more energy than we thought. Uh, and perhaps uh, taking a little bit longer uh, than we thought. We found ourselves in the water at low tide. Uh, and at low tide, uh, when you put into the places that we can actually go in these kayaks, there are a lot of things under that water that you cannot see as you glide graciously along the top that are more than willing to stop you in the activity that you are engaging in. You're out for a nice leisurely ride. Next thing you know, you're sitting on a sandbar that's 50 yards off ashore wondering how in the world, why, and all the other questions that go along with it. 
you end up doing more of that, uh, what do they call those guys, gondoliers? You end up looking more like a gondolier than a, than a kayaker. So here we are, we're at uh, basically VA Park, uh, and uh, we're sitting on sandbars trying to push ourselves off, and I'm pretty sure every single bird that's there waiting is laughing at us. I'm pretty sure everybody on shore is probably taking pictures of us to post somewhere to make fun of us, but uh, it takes us a little more energy takes us a little more effort, but eventually we find uh, our way in and, and safety and uh, things uh, go well. Uh, and we end up having a great time. But hidden things uh, are often things that can cause you the great danger. Near where we were, unfortunately we didn't hit any of these, are, are these large rocks. And, and you could see if the water level rises that those rocks will be hidden as well. And, and it reminded uh, me of the passage that we talked about uh, in Jude in the class that's in the auditorium tonight. Jude says this, <clears throat> speaking of uh, the false teacher, he says, These are hidden reefs at your love feast, as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds, swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted like wild waves of the sea, casting up foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever." And what Jude writes here is just this string of metaphors giving us a description of the defiled, the abhorrent, uh, the pestilent nature uh, of those who would take God's word and his graciousness and, and his act of love in, in his Savior and blaspheme it or, or use it to actually draw people away from something that is the truth. They're like that rock that's barely under the water that you can't see. They're like that sandbar that's ready and waiting just to reach out and grab you and stop your forward progress. But you see, Jesus is the exact opposite. In him, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. With Christ, there is absolute transparency. There's nothing hidden just below the surface that's going to shipwreck you. There's nothing hidden beneath the, the darkness of the wave that is going to cause you to somehow, unbeknownst to you, lose, lose spiritually or not gain that victory that he promises. See, our adversary on one hand, he is the liar and the father of all lies. Christ is all about the truth and illuminating, shining the light so that we can see all of the hurdles. Now, doesn't take the hurdles out of the way. Sometimes those are the ways that we grow. But with him we can see all of that because he is light. In him there is no darkness at all. There's no crag. There's no rock. There's no sandbar. There's no sabotage. So the question very simply tonight is, what waters are you kayaking on? Is it the water full of the sandbar and the, the, the rock and the uncertainty? Or is it the water that, yes, still has those same things, but is illuminated by our radiant Savior? Have we put him on the helm of the boat and let him guide our path? Have you entered into a relationship with him? Is he helping guide you through that strait? Well, maybe you're here tonight. And it's time. And you know it's time. Having read God's Word, understood it, knowing what is at stake, do you have that faith, that strength of conviction that allows you to want to do something about the sin that is in your life? To confess the name of Christ? To enter into the waters of baptism so you can be washed clean of your sin? Have you done all that? but failed to continue faithfully on your journey, heading back once more for the dangerous waters that are dark and deep? If you're here tonight and subject to the invitation's call in any way, come while we stand and sing.